On this Tuesday night, the farewell to George Floyd. I want justice for my brother. The passion and the grief. I thank God for giving me, giving me my own personal Superman. And the political messages. Someone said, make America great again. But when has America ever been great? For a man whose death gave life to a worldwide movement. Also tonight, a reality check on police body cameras. The RCMP plans to start using them. How effective are they? Fears of a COVID-19 resurgence and lingering questions about whether people without symptoms can spread the virus. Plus, the Canadian community underwater and in a state of emergency. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the funeral for a man we'd never heard of until 15 days ago. A man the world only learned the name of after he died in police custody. A 46-year-old black man whose name is now synonymous with calls for racial justice. George Floyd, his body in a gold casket, was laid to rest today in his hometown of Houston, Texas. All of us know the name of George Floyd. Out of his death has come a movement a worldwide movement. That movement is going to change the world. Hundreds came to the Houston church for the funeral, including the families of other black men killed in police custody. I shall see his face. For more than two hours, they sang, they prayed, and they demanded justice. Floyd's body was then taken by horse-drawn carriage to his final resting place a grave in Houston next to his mother. This was not just a tragedy. It was a crime. Lives like George will not matter until somebody pays the cost for taking their lives. And until we know the price for black life is the same as the price for white life, we're gonna keep coming back to these situations over and over again. In that eulogy, the Reverend Al Sharpton highlighted the long history of black men killed in America. Jackson Prosco in a service that was both deeply personal and resoundingly political. The man whose death sparked a national movement was celebrated in the city where he spent most of his life. And you find it hard to even breathe. George Floyd was honored by friends and family, people who wanted the world to know about the person they've lost. Tim, I love you, and um, I thank God for giving me, giving me my own personal Superman. I bless you all. Known as Big Floyd to those close to him, he was remembered as a gentle giant, a man who would never have expected to become a household name. Those four officers were literally on him for nine minutes and none of them show they have a heart or soul. This is not just murder, but a hate crime. Inside the Houston church, a celebration of life was mixed with reflection on two weeks of national outrage. We are for all these young black men that are coming up in this world today and just hug them and love them because we don't ever know when the time will come. Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden, who met Floyd's family on Monday, spoke by video, joining calls to address systemic racism in America. We can't turn away. We must not turn away. We cannot leave this moment thinking we can once again turn away from racism that stings at our very soul. The mother of Eric Garner, will you stand? In the crowd of mourners, the families of other black Americans killed at the hands of police coming together in hope this moment will finally bring about change. All of these families came to stand with this family because they know better than anyone else the pain they will suffer from the loss that they have gone through. George Floyd will rest in history as a man who inspired a national reckoning. Buried next to his mother, the woman he called out for during his final moments under the knee of a police officer. Jackson Prosco, Global News. 
We'll have more moments from the funeral a little later in the newscast. Here in Canada, pressure is mounting for police forces to equip more officers with body cameras. They're already in use or a part of pilot projects in some jurisdictions. The RCMP commissioner says it is now going to begin the process of equipping some Mounties with body cams. Abigail Beeman explains what difference they could make. My son was 17 years old. He was having a really bad day. Riley Fairholm was shot and killed by police in Quebec nearly two years ago. Ever since, his mother has been pushing for body cameras. And I'm naive. I mean, look at the color of my skin. You know, I mean, in the wake of all of this, I think it's important that I never thought it would happen to me. In the wake of George Floyd's death and more clashes between police and black and indigenous Canadians, calls echoing Tracy Wings are getting louder. Forces like the Toronto Police Service and the RCMP are supportive, so is Canada's public safety minister. Okay. Video evidence can provide the best possible evidence to help inform um, exactly what transpired. Calgary was the first big city to roll out cameras for all frontline officers. Several smaller municipalities use them too, but there is little Canadian data about how well they work. Internationally, results are mixed. Cameras are much more common in the U.S. A 2017 study out of Washington, D.C. noted 95% of police departments either have them or plan to adopt them. But it found body-worn cameras had no statistically significant effects. For a Made in Canada solution, we really need Made in Canada data that we don't have. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association has serious concerns about privacy. Critics also point out officers can turn cameras on and off. They're also expensive, as more people call to defund police. Is It just increases police budgets and it increases forms of surveillance. It doesn't decrease the amount of policing in our community and the amount of racism or violent incidents of police. It's not a silver bullet. Elaine Babineau served with the RCMP for nearly three decades. He believes body cameras are critical for 21st century policing, combined with the right policies. And I think we've come to a point now where, you know, people, the government, people, those in decision-making uh, uh, positions are actually listening. And that is, uh, that is to me, a watershed moment. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Now to the pandemic, in particular, the economic impact. About 3 million Canadians are still out of a job or looking for work, and about 8 million Canadians have received federal help, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, or CERB. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he's going to introduce legislation to tighten the rules on the program and could impose fines and jail time on those who deliberately lie on their applications. Those people will simply have to pay back uh, the one that they uh, shouldn't have been taken. And we're not looking at punishing people who made honest mistakes. Obviously, this is a time for us to pull together as a country. The Prime Minister says when the program was put in place, the priority was to have the money flow rapidly. That's left gaps in the system that some are exploiting. As Mike Lucatur reports, the government is under pressure to crack down on fraudulent claims, but avoid making criminals out of people who made honest mistakes. Like many Canadians, Derek Bosch has been locked down at home since mid-March. Unlike others, though, he can't go back to work even as his province is reopening because he's undergoing cancer treatment. I'm at a severe risk for immune uh, infection and compromise because of the treatment I'm in and that I should be home for the duration of the pandemic, um, not just the first wave, second wave, third wave. Problem is, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is capped at 16 weeks, which means Bosch's last check will come in July. He looked at the government website to see what other help is out there, but didn't find much. The only other option it came up with was, you cannot be evicted for not paying your rent, which is not a funding solution. He's also worried that if he reapplies for the CERB, officials might think he's trying to defraud the system, something the government is trying to crack down on with new legislation that could impose fines of up to $5,000 or even jail time. We do need the tools to go after those who deliberately choose to take advantage of people and systems' vulnerability in a time of crisis. A government source says the average rate of fraud for any federal program at any time is between 1 and 2 percent. So with $43.5 billion already paid out through the CERB, 
it's possible between 43 and 87 million dollars may have already been claimed by fraudsters. The economy starts to reopen. Being a minority government, the Liberals need opposition support, and so far the NDP isn't on side. While the Prime Minister took a knee one day, the same day his government was putting in place a law that would criminalize people who were desperate. How does the Prime Minister think that makes any sense at all to do? Of course, if people made good faith mistakes, uh, there are not going to be uh, punitive consequences for them. The Bloc Québécois says it'll support Trudeau on three conditions, including that he presents an economic update to the country by July the 1st. The Prime Minister hasn't ruled that out, but he says there's so much uncertainty with the pandemic that making projections about the economy would be an exercise in innovation and imagination. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. One of the juggling acts parents with young kids face is what to do with their kids if they go back to work. Now in Ontario, all licensed child care centres will be allowed to reopen on Friday with limits on the number of staff and children. There will be screening protocols in place and increased cleaning, including removing certain toys more likely to spread COVID-19. Ontario is still reporting far more new cases each day than most other provinces, but there are signs of hope. There were 230 new confirmed cases in Ontario today. The second day in a row, fewer than 300 new cases have been reported. Ontario's hospitals are able to handle all those cases, but they're now dealing with a new influx of people, people needing treatment for other conditions. As Mike Jolet explains, overcrowding is as bad now as it was before the pandemic. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Humber River Hospital in Toronto was one of the busiest in the country. For three months, healthcare workers were pushed to their limits. Look over here. And here. But today, even with fewer COVID cases, hospital ERs are just as busy. We had a lot of patients that may have needed to come in for care that were resisting a little bit. Uh, and so we're seeing people come in a little bit more, but we are still seeing people that have waited perhaps too long. And while those patients are getting help, doctors say the system is once again being pushed to its limits. According to the Ontario Health Association, there were 5,200 patients in acute care hospital beds on March 1st who had been treated yet had nowhere else to go. As COVID-19 spread, that number dipped, but it's now back up to pre-COVID-19 levels. Before the pandemic, the problem was due to a lack of spaces in long-term care facilities. And now those same facilities can't take new patients until COVID-19 is under control, leaving hospitals to pick up the slack. It's been showing over and over again, hospitals are terrible for people who don't need to be there. They need to get out of the hospital setting to prevent them from getting infections and all sorts of other complications in hospitals and be able to go back home. The hope is that the Ontario government will begin easing restrictions within a few weeks, at least regionally, since most of the COVID-19 cases are in the greater Toronto area. Mackenzie Health Centre in Richmond Hill, for one, tells Global News it's operating at 97% capacity, so a return to normalcy will take time. Elective surgeries, for example, had been postponed because of the pandemic, and there's now a massive backlog that can't be fully addressed until after fear of a second wave of COVID-19 has passed. It's a precarious point for all of us, and that's as we watch really those numbers to say, as we start opening things up, what are we going to see? And nobody wants to make that decision prematurely. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. Fewer restrictions means new infections. Coming up, the resurgence of COVID-19 in different parts of the world. It's hard to believe, but it was three months ago this week the World Health Organization declared a pandemic and countries imposed restrictions to limit the spread of COVID-19. Now, as restrictions begin to be eased, there are fears some countries, such as Russia, which lifted a two-month lockdown in Moscow today, are acting too soon. Nearly half a million people have contracted COVID-19 in Russia, and more than 6,000 people have died from it. Moscow, where many businesses reopened today, makes up about half of the cases. And more than a thousand people are still getting COVID-19 in the Russian capital every day. There are now more than 7 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 worldwide. As parts of the world slowly return to some semblance of everyday life, other countries are being gripped with big outbreaks. And the number of new cases is rising faster than ever. Crystal Gamansing looks at where cases of COVID-19 are surging and why. 
There's a curfew in place, but even without it, there's not much to do. The Iraqi capital of Baghdad is locked down because of COVID-19, and the military is keeping watch. In neighboring Iran, there's a second wave of illness. COVID-19 cases have returned to peak levels. Thousands of new infections detected after restrictions were eased. Chile is also experiencing another spike. There's recent uptick in Poland and in Brazil, infections are climbing unabated. Although the situation in Europe is improving, globally it's worsening. More than 100,000 cases have been reported on nine of the past 10 days. Lockdowns can be incredibly useful in terms of slowing down the spread of the virus, but as we've seen here in the UK, they're also harmful to the economy. In places such as Latin and Central America, which are now hot spots, experts say they just don't have the luxury to shut things down. We know that Latin America is the most inequitable region in the world and also one of the most urbanized regions in the world. So we have big cities like Rio, Sao Paulo, Lima, in where they are surrounded by belt of poverty and inequities. It's been three months since the virus was declared a pandemic. With continued transmission in some locations and people regaining the ability to move around in others, there will be waves of infection everywhere. The next three months are going to look just like these three months. You know, the fact remains, probably in a city like Toronto, maybe 3%, maybe 5% at most of us have been infected with this, which means there's still 95% of the population who have not had it yet. That leaves all of us keeping our distance, washing our hands, and paying attention to those regionally specific statistics so we're aware of what the virus is doing. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. One of the biggest unknowns is asymptomatic transmission, people who have COVID-19 but have no symptoms. Yesterday, the World Health Organization said asymptomatic transmission is very rare. That sparked a lot of pushback from experts who say not enough is known to be definitive about it, and there's still a risk of so-called silent spreaders. Well, today the WHO backtracked, saying it's a misunderstanding to state that asymptomatic transmission is very rare. What I didn't report yesterday um, was because this is a major unknown, because there's so many unknowns around this, um, some groups, some modeling groups have tried to estimate what is the proportion of asymptomatic people that may transmit? But some estimates of around 40% of, of transmission may be due to asymptomatic. Um, but those are from models. Um, and so I didn't include that in my answer yesterday, but wanted to make sure that I covered that. The WHO says more study is needed to determine how many asymptomatic people there are and how many might be contagious. China is rejecting some research that claims COVID-19 started spreading in Wuhan as early as last August, long before it was identified at a seafood market at the end of December. The Harvard research, which has not been peer-reviewed, analyzed satellite images of hospital parking lots as well as data from internet searches for symptoms. Researchers don't know for certain if the upward trend in hospital traffic and search volume is directly linked to the new coronavirus. Their findings may suggest something was already circulating in Wuhan by the time the outbreak was declared. Still ahead, felony in fruit, how pineapple pulp led to a record-setting drug bust. Police in Poland have seized a record amount of cocaine and they had to work to find it. Investigators used axes to hack frozen blocks of pineapple pulp to reveal the drugs, about three tons worth. It has an estimated street value of $1 billion. Three men have been arrested. Officials say the haul originally came from Ecuador. There's some sad news about that humpback whale that was spotted in the St. Lawrence River near Montreal. The body of the humpback, believed to be two to three years old, was seen drifting down the river today, about 30 kilometers from Montreal's old port. Nobody knows why the humpback made it that far up the St. Lawrence. It may have been lost or was searching for food. Fisheries and Oceans Canada will now perform a necropsy to determine what the humpback died from. A relentless rainstorm is flooding southern Manitoba, leading the community of Stewartburn to declare a state of emergency. A weekend storm brought up to 155 millimeters of rain to parts of Manitoba, washing out roads and drowning fields. The downpour is forecast to continue into Wednesday. 
Near the U.S. border, crews are scrambling to prevent more damage. There are fears the fast-moving water might overwhelm the area's 40-year-old dikes. Next, the legacy of George Floyd, passionate tributes to a man who has inspired so many to demand equality. What mourners in Houston, Texas vowed today is that laying to rest George Floyd will not stop the movement his death has started, that the calls for justice, the calls to recognize a black life is worth as much as a white life will not go quiet. The story won't end. We leave you tonight with more moments from George Floyd's funeral. Say goodbye to what we had. I don't know if I'll ever be able to overcome the words, I can't breathe. Who would have thought that his name would now be mentioned in South Africa, Canada, Nairobi, Berlin, South Korea, Europe? A person who may not have been known by many before. I don't know where this road is going to lead. These laws need to be changed. No more hate crimes, please. Someone said make America great again, but when has America ever been great? We honor him today because when he took his last breath, the rest of us will now be able to breathe. All I know is where we've been. Right now, I want justice for my brother, my big brother. That's Big Floyd. Everybody know who Big Floyd is now. I hope it's worth all the pain. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday.